related to the Qissa of Musa, of Isa, in fact, Yusuf alayhi salam as well. There's a whole chapter in the Quran, Surah Yusuf. But let us begin anyway in Surah Al Sad, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a kind of an introduction to Sulaiman alayhi salam, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'da'udhu billahi minash shaitan al rajim, wa wahabna li Dawood Sulaiman ni'ma al abdu innahu awwab. That Allah blessed Dawood alayhi salam, the Prophet Dawood, I don't know if it was mentioned in the previous uh, lessons, but um, Dawood alayhi salam's son was the Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. So Allah blessed, Allah says in the Quran, we blessed or we gave as a gift to Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam. It is a gift because a Nabi gives birth to another Nabi and they're the best of people. So it's a gift that Allah endows to whoever he chooses. So Allah gave Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam. Then Allah says, Ni'ma al abd. What a great servant. What a great Nabi what he was. He was in utter humility and servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah praises him, Ni'ma. What a great servant he was. And what was one of the things that made him great? Allah says, Innahu awwab. He used to make a lot of tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one lesson here is that Tawbah, a da'wah carrier, someone in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or a general Muslim, should make as part of his retinue of actions, daily actions, Tawbah. It's something that Rasulullah did innumerable times, and he needed istighfar. When Allah, you know, he is the beloved of Allah, he went to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah forgave all of his errors and mistakes. Past and present. And yet Rasulullah sought istighfar even to teach us, part of his ummah, that this should be an action of the believer. And it's a very praiseworthy action to make tawbah to Allah. This is one of the ways in which someone becomes humble, becomes humble, acknowledges their weakness. It's an acknowledgement. It's hard to turn to Allah every day for the minor sins, the major sins that we might do, or the sins that we know or we don't know. So what made one of the great things that Allah mentions about Sulaiman alayhi salam? Innahu awwab. He was someone who returned to Allah often, meaning made tawbah to Allah often. And what a great servant of ours he was. So look how Allah praises Sulaiman alayhi salam. Then Allah, Allah says, and here's it, Allah then, we've got to understand that sometimes the Quran is very contracted. It's not a long-winded book. The, one of the beautiful things about the Quran is that it's so brief. It snaps you into one moment in time straight away. And you think, oh my God, where's the trail? Or how come there was no build-up? Like the Quran is very ter terse like that. It's very brief. It has what's called contracted diction. It has contracted words. And see, it's beautiful. It's part of the amazing qualities of the Quran. So that Allah straight away goes into uh, telling us something about, describing us something about Sulaiman Ali Salaam. He's trying to build a character picture for us. So Allah says, إِذْ عُرِدَ عَلَيْهِ بِالْعَشِيِّ الصَّافِنَاتِ الْجِيَادِ When displayed before Sulaiman alayhi salam were swift running horses. Sulaiman alayhi salam loved horses. He loved horses. He loved them because they were the vehicles for doing jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sulaiman alayhi salam was one who was very favorable for jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he loved horses. He loved them. So when uh, a number of horses were displayed to him, some of the Mufassirun say thousands, these were swift running horses. Some of them say, like, you know, uh, 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 they were like the best battle horses. Some of them say they were the horses of Dawood alayhi salam, that they were all horses Dawood alayhi salam used to win the jihad. <coughs> that Allah showed that to Sulaiman alayhi salam. Whatever type of horse it is, they were swift running horses, they were war steeds. They were war steeds. And they were presented before Sulaiman alayhi salam. And then he says, and then what happened here? The Quran doesn't fill that in, but Mufassiru mentioned that when these horses were displayed to Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was so enamoured by watching them, you know, stroking their mane and like, you know, their, their backs and so on, their hooves. The some of the Mufassiru say the Asr time had passed. And Sulaiman alayhi salam missed the Asr. Now some of them say it wasn't Salat al-Asr of that time. It was some 
time that Sulaiman used to use to remember Allah. Anyway, whatever it was, whether it was a salah or a time where Sulaiman used to remember Allah, or some prescribed action of the Sharia of Sulaiman whatever it was, he missed it. Alayhi salam. And then he, Allah mentions that in the Quran, فقال, He said, إِنِّي أَحْبَبْتُ حُبَّ الْخَيْرِ عَنْ ذِكْرِ رَبِّي حَتَّى تَوَارَتْ بِالْحِجَابِ I was so enamored and so distracted and so engulfed and preoccupied by this khayr, these horses, that I forgot or I was distracted from the remembrance of my Lord. Hatta tawarat al hijab until it became dark or the night was veiled or the day was veiled. So the asr time or whatever time it was to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sulaiman used to do, he forgot that. He forgot that. And then he says, uh, um, he then made to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a, a repentance to say, Allah, you know, forgive me for overcoming or forgetting your remembrance. And then Allah, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? وَرُدُّوهَ عَلَيَّ ثَفَقِ مَصْحَمْ بِالصُّوْكِ وَالْعَنَاقِ Then Allah returned the horses back to him and he started stroking their heads and their, their legs because he was so fond of the horses. Some of the Mufassirun say, because he was so angry, that he, the horses distracted him from the remembrance of Allah, that he slaughtered all those horses. Anyway, some of the Mufassirun preferred the interpretation that a Nabi wouldn't necessarily kill animals um, just like that. Whatever the reason is, um, he was distracted from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a lesson here for us, for us to remember that this is a Nabi who missed a prescribed time where you should remember Allah. And it, it, it happened incidentally, with Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa taslim when the Asr time had elapsed and Rasulullah because he was in battle had missed the Asr salah so the point for us is that we need to think about what is our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is our dhikr with Allah you see if the da'wah carrier especially engaged in the work to bring about the Islamic way of life working for the Islamic authority the Dawla Islamiyyah he has to be with Allah ana al-layl wa atraf al-nahar. In the Kitab al-Nafsiyyah book it says, the da'i ila Allah must be with Allah day and night. Meaning the kind of people that are going to be required to bring back the Islamic way of life, to resume that Islamic way of life, are going to have to be those people who are connected to Allah day and night. Meaning they're not disengaged from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you think about it, ask ourselves, well first, this nafsi al mukhti awwalan, yani, this wretched soul first, that how many of us, you know, do we batter an eyelid, or do we actually care that if we start to forget the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does it bother us if we forget Allah? <coughs> I'm not talking just about the salah, or the, the salah al faridah just the prescribed actions, I'm not talking about those. Actions that get us close to Allah. If we start to forget these or neglect these, does it affect us? I mean, do we think about it? Sulaiman alayhi salam being a Nabi, the first thing that he's remembering, oh my gosh, I was distracted from the remembrance of my Lord. I was distracted from the remembrance of my Lord. Us as well. You know, time is, you know, we, time is so short. You know, the fact that time is shrinking more and more, and we're feeling it like that. It's almost a sign that the barakah has been taken at the time. It's like the blessing has been taken at the time. You now we have to ask ourselves, are we people who desire to be connected with Allah day and night, engage in his remembrance, in his dhikr? Whether that dhikr is by yourself or collectively, it doesn't really matter. So what are the avenues by which we are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So a Nabi here is telling us that he was distracted by the horses in the service of Allah for jihad. This wasn't just a normal action, I was in telly or something, yeah, playing games, it wasn't that. It was looking at the steeds of war in preparation for jihad. Because he was so enamored by it, making them, brushing them, stroking them, he forgot that prescribed action. And we all got to ask ourselves, are we, what are we doing? Are we the kind of person who don't really care if we're not connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance? So something for us to think about. Something for us to think about. Alright, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ سُلَيْمَانَ وَلَقَيْنَ عَلَى قُرْسِيِّهِ جَسَدًا ثُمَّ ثُمَّ أَنَا So, 
Sulaiman alayhi salam was then tested by Allah at one point where Allah put on his throne a jasad. Some people say it was like a, a lifeless body. Some people say it was half a child. Anyway, something was put on the throne of Sulaiman alayhi salam and he lost his kingdom. And then Allah returned it back to him. And some of the ulama say the reason why Sulaiman alayhi salam, Allah took his throne away from him, his power away from him, was that he, you know, he had over uh, a thousand wives, Sulaiman alayhi salam. That was the, the will of Allah and the sharia of Sulaiman alayhi salam, that they were allowed that many wives and innumerable, innumerable concubines. Um, and Sulaiman alayhi salam, according to some of the Mufassirun, one day said that he was going to visit um, a third of his wives um, to um, spend the night with each of them so that they will bear him a progeny, a child. But he didn't say insha'Allah. No qal insha'Allah. If he were to say insha'Allah, then Allah would have enabled him to do that and gave him a, a son, an heir. But because he didn't say insha'Allah, Allah then took the power and the authority away from him. That's when Allah says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ Sulaiman." We tested Sulaiman by putting a jasad, a lifeless body, on his throne. Some people said it was him in his old age, like, you know, that's how he's going to become. Some people said half a child, lifeless child. So whatever it was, Sulaiman had his mulk, his kingdom taken away. But then when he repented, Allah returned it back to him. So even Anbiya are tested. Anbiya are tested. And the followers of the Anbiya will be tested. Just like the Anbiya before us were tested, just like Rasulullah and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'im were tested, the Ummah of Rasulullah will be tested. Human beings in general will be tested. Um, whatever that test might be, sometimes people think a test has to be an earth-shaking thing. Like becoming bankrupt or becoming homeless. It doesn't necessarily have to be like that. It depends on the person. Allah can test us with many different things, with wealth, with money, with food. Whatever it could be. For one person it might be something easy, for another person it might be something difficult. Whatever it is, every person will be tested. Yeah, this is the Darul Fitna. This is the abode, this world is the abode of fitna, meaning tests and tribulations and trials. And Allah says that, isn't it? Hasib al nas. That do people think that we're gonna leave them um, just to say we believe and then when they're not gonna be tested? Do people think that's what's going to happen? No, Allah will test us. He might even test us in the most horrendous way. He might even test it in the most horrendous way. And the ulama have written down loads of wisdom related to being tested. Some of them could be, for example, it being a means of getting us closer to Allah. It's a way of purifying our sins. Because whenever we go through hardship, like an illness, it is a means of purifying us. A means of purifying us. A third thing is a, it's a means of soul building. It's a means of building our nafsiyah. You know, so it's like chiseling something or pounding something into shape. So ibtila, even though we might think, oh, what's the, what's the point? But through it, Allah either brings us closer to Him, wipes away our sins, or builds our souls. So we are ready for the hereafter, or we're ready for whatever Allah is going to bring us with. So if Anbiya are tested, then the followers of the Anbiya are definitely going to be tested. So Sulaiman alayhi salam, after that, learning his lesson, he says, قَالَ رَبِّ فِلْ لِي وَهَبْ لِي مُلْكًا لَا يَنْبَغِ لِي أَحَدْ مِنْ بَعْدِي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَّابِ Oh Allah, grant me a kingdom like you've never granted anyone else before. You are the one who is the greatest of givers and bestowers. And the ulama say that two believers and two non-believers were the most powerful uh, rulers ever. Out of the believers, it was Sulaiman alayhi salam who had one of the greatest kingdoms, one of the greatest regions of authority. The other one is Dhul-Qarnayn, out of the believers. And then out of the non-believers, it was Nimrud. It was Nimrud. And the other one, Bukhta Nasr, was one of the two of the great non-believing um, people who had authority and power. These were the people who Allah gave the highest authority like, in the land. So Sulaiman Ali Salam Dhul Kharnain were two people who were given the greatest mulk, the greatest sort of dominion 
power authority.